things that NASA would find uh, uh, on you know the moons of Saturn, uh, beneath the surface of Mars, etc., etc. But she was joking the whole time about uh, needing to serve more wine because of the depressing nature of the extinction and the, the you know the, the lack of finding life on, on other planets. Um, in any case, I don't think tonight will be that depressing. So uh, I think, in fact, it will be quite quite fascinating. Um, so yeah, without further ado, uh, I'm Jeff, I'm the co-director of the space, and uh, I'm, yeah, I'm really excited actually to have uh, Michael Gerard, uh, who's a colleague of ours up in Columbia. Um, albeit in the School of Law. And um, he's the Andrew Sabin Professor of Professional Practice in the Law School, as well as the Director of the Center for Climate Change Law. Um, and has been doing some really interesting work on, um, as you would expect, uh, climate change and law, uh, but also on uh, the particular topic that really caught my eye with uh, some recent uh, work he's been doing on the fates of nations that are threatened by rising sea levels in an era of climate change. Um, and uh, organized a conference, uh, I believe it was 2010, not 2011? It was, or was, 11, oh, it was 2011. <laughs> um, that looked at, uh, amongst many other things, um, specifically the fate of the, the Marshall Islands uh, when it comes to uh, rising waters and uh, where, what happens to nations in a kind of post-territorial uh, condition. What are their legal rights? Um, you know, do they still have a seat at the United Nations, et cetera? All the, all the questions that are associated with that. Um, it's, it's a, needless to say, a very compelling topic, um, so we'll be talking about that and other, other aspects of, of climate change law. Um, and then I'll, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, so I'll ask four or five questions, and then if there's anything out in the audience, um, I'll open it up to you guys. So uh, definitely uh, feel free to, to chime in. Um, well, so first of all, yeah, I'd love to, um, you know, your, your bio, um, I believe at the Earth Institute, you know, says that you literally wrote the book on climate change and, um, and law. And uh, I guess I'm just curious about uh, your own uh, professional practice and how you came specifically to environmental law um, and then how that in gradually became uh, uh, climate change and law and what that does to uh, your work vis-a-vis -vis things like uh, jurisdiction, responsibility, uh, uh, and who, how one legalizes the question of climate change. So let me start with a one-minute autobiography that sure. answers some of that. I grew up in Charleston, West Virginia, which is a town dominated by the. Can you hear me, Orion? Yes. Okay. A town dominated by the chemical industry. And when I was a kid growing up there in the 1960s, uh, the pollution was terrible. The air pollution. We lived on the banks of the Kanawha River, which at the time was basically a uh, receiving water for the industrial waste from Union Carbide and Dupont and Monsanto. Uh, I came to New York to go to college at Columbia, and I, while I was in college, it was the first Earth Day in 1970, uh, which I wrote my senior thesis on the air pollution in West Virginia. And when I graduated, worked for an environmental group here in New York and decided to become an environmental lawyer. So I entered law school in 1975 with the objective of becoming an environmental lawyer, and that's what I did. So between my graduation in 1978, and well, for the next 30 years, I practiced environmental law here in New York. Uh, but around 2005, I began work on what was my seventh book called The Law of, uh, it's called Global Climate Change in U.S. Law. And, uh, I educated myself on the subject, and then three years later, unexpectedly, the opportunity arose to join the faculty at Columbia Law School as a professor. With I started up the Center for Climate Change Law to uh, be in the center for study and, and work and information and education on climate law issues. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think uh, one of the things that I, I'm sure that if, if there are questions in the audience we can come back to, which is just general environmental law practice, and um, you know, which include local or, or regional issues here in the, in the New York area or, or within the borders of the United States. But um, I'm really fascinated at where uh, climate change law uh, intersects with international relations and or at least, um, uh, you know, conflicts between states, conflicts between um, say a chemical company in one country whose emissions are going into another or are affecting the atmosphere that might affect another country. Um, and I guess I'm curious about the actual um, work that is required to litigate or make relevant claims that extend across national borders and where the challenges are there? For someone who, for, as my question probably indicates, has uh, absolutely no training whatsoever in, in, in international law. So let me start by saying that the, the fundamental international law on climate change is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was negotiated exactly 20 years ago in Rio. 
month, the Rio Plus 20 conference is beginning to look at what's happened since then and, and at the other uh, agreements that were negotiated then. Uh, but the framework, framework convention was supported by the first President Bush. It was overwhelmingly ratified by the United States Senate and went into effect. But it, it was basically a set of objectives and a framework for procedures. It didn't have teeth associated with it. The, the actual way to achieve its objective of preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, which is what the treaty says, uh, was worked out in Kyoto in 1997, and so that was the Kyoto Protocol, excuse <coughs> me, which then Vice President Gore was, uh, negotiated for the United States, but which the United States never ratified. The uh, United States Senate passed a resolution by a vote of 95 to 0 opposing ratification of any international agreement that did not impose on the on the rapidly developing countries by which they met China and India, the same kind of emission reduction obligations that apply to the U.S. And Kyoto did not do that, so the U.S. never ratified it. And so for a long time, the only major developed countries in the world that were not signatories to the Kyoto Protocol were Australia and the U.S. About three years ago, Australia signed on, so uh, we're the only remaining country. Um, but in terms Although of the, Canada pulled out of their obligations, is that correct? Uh, several countries uh, that had initially ratified Kyoto have very recently said they're not going to sign on to a second commitment period. But it, the Kyoto Protocol obligated countries to do certain things from 2008 through 2012. So the end of 2012 is uh, looming. Mm -hmm. and so there have been a lot of negotiations about what happens after 2012. So, uh, Japan and Canada and Russia all recently said, uh, 2012, that's it. We're not going forward uh, with anything after 2012, unless there's a major new thing that people have to agree to. But on your question of countries suing each other, um, you, there, are, you, there are commercial disputes which happen all the time. Which to arbitration. There is something called the International Court of Justice, which has the ability to adjudicate claims between countries if those countries have agreed to its jurisdiction. Uh, a central element of all international law is that a country is only bound by a treaty that it has signed on to. The U.S. has not signed on to the general jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. It has signed on for a few limited purposes, but none that are relevant here. The ICJ does occasionally hear uh, environmental claims. You know, they, they sit in the hate and people can bring the claims. There was a, an important dispute that they decided about three years ago between Argentina and Uruguay over a dam that was built in the river that was a border between the two countries. But for the most part, there are very limited rights. There, there are there's some adjudication. There's a famous case between the U.S. and Canada called the Trail Smelter case, which was the smelter in Canada was causing pollution here. But those those kinds of, of disputes are, are not at all common uh, in the judicial system. Often they just sort of work out. Um, well, then, when the transition from a, from basically a cross-border environmental. Uh, suit to something specifically involving climate change. I guess I'm curious, and there's so much, uh, at, at least in the United States, uh, you know, uh, reluctance even to believe that climate change is even a, a scientific fact. I guess I'm curious about what are the legal challenges in saying, um, moving beyond just that, you know, say China is damming rivers in Tibet that no longer bring water to India, and therefore there's a legal problem for water access, but specifically dealing with um, ideas of climate change and their effects. What does that do to the the, the practice of law uh, and the, I guess, I guess I could even, you could even say the, um, I don't know, the, the, the evidence one needs to argue a case, especially if you're in a situation where the, the judges maybe in a, in a situation like in the United States might not even believe that what you're talking about is a real thing. So I'm going to contest part of, uh, of what you said. Uh, okay. the, um, uh, the skepticism about climate change in the United States is noisy, but it's not very deep. Okay. Uh, there are obviously a group of skeptics. They have taken over the political party. They have a network. They have a 
television network. Uh, <laughs> they have a, uh, a newspaper located a few blocks from here. Uh, uh, but it is not as, um, it is not nearly as broad or deep as it sounds from look at, listening to the cacophony. And so far, they haven't convinced any judges. Actually, all the cases that have come up on climate change in the courts, there, there really hasn't been evidence that the judges are skeptical, uh, or at least that too many of them are skeptical. Uh, the United States Supreme Court has ruled twice that uh, uh, climate change is, is a legitimate subject for, for regulation. There's been one trial in the United States on the science of climate change in the case of Vermont that I can't believe the details of, but it basically came out resoundingly in favor of the climate science. So the, the, the difficulty isn't that the judges don't believe in climate science, the difficulty is whether there are laws that give judges jurisdiction over this kind of thing as opposed to administrative agencies. So the most recent U.S. Supreme Court decision on this subject, which came out in uh, June, past June, a case called American Electric Power versus Connecticut, uh, basically said that the, the courts shouldn't get into the business of setting the rules and deciding what's an appropriate or inappropriate amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Congress, when it enacted the Clean Air Act, gave that power to EPA, so it's EPA's job to do that. Uh, and, you know, there, there are, are details so forth, but that's the that's the basic idea. And so, the lawsuits that are brought in the United States on climate change uh, uh, are brought under statutes, mostly, mostly the Clean Air Act and a few others. There there are a couple of these common law cases that are still hanging around by the uh, skin of their teeth. We'll, we'll see what happens with them. Now, internationally, it's completely different from sure. I mean, Internationally, it's really a matter of for diplomats, uh, many of them are lawyers, but it's not, it's, it's not being adjudicated much in international tribunals. There is one case that may be brought, and I'm involved in that, uh, the Republic of uh, Palau, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, are asking the United Nations General Assembly to refer to the International Court of Justice. The question is that what is the responsibility of the major emitting states uh, to the small island nations that are threatened with uh, submersion by sea level. So if the General Assembly does refer to the International Court of Justice, it may issue an advisory opinion on that. And I've been acting as an informal advisor to allow the Marshall Islands in that, in that matter. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Can you guys that speak up a tiny bit? Yeah. Oh, yes, sir, like one of the mics is sort of feedback from that, so I turned it a little bit down. Okay. Uh, and is it, there sound coming out of that speaker? Is that right? Or, is, is there sound coming out of that speaker? I think so. Like, no? That's the, that's the, well, here's sound. I don't know if it's coming directly out of here. That was, yeah, was your mics is you really well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Is, is this better? Yes. yes. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, so, yeah, along, along the lines of, of, of where the, the last answer left off, um, yeah, but the, the thing that I'm most interested in, in discussing actually is, um, yeah, exactly the, what your work has been asking about the, uh, the uh, legal fate, the sovereign fate of, of, of nations that are threatened by sea level rise. What, um, Happens to them, what, what they what they are owed if, if this this comes to pass, and um, what what exactly you would be advocating in a, in a position paper on this, as far as uh, you know, uh, what the other nations of the world might owe them, or what what industrial um, nations might, uh, you know, there's questions of reparations, there's questions of land, there's questions of, uh, for that matter, discounted real estate purchases in countries like Australia to take refugees, et cetera, et cetera. I guess I'm just curious about, um, yeah, what you uh, specifically. Uh, recommend in, the, in that particular case, but then I'll tell you what happens to, to nations, legally speaking, when they when they lose territory. So let me tell you how I got into this, just in okay. one minute. About two and a half years ago, I was approached by the ambassador to the United Nations from the Republic of the Marshall Islands saying that some decade, they don't know what decade it is, but some decade they're going to be underwater. And when that happens, are they still a state? Do they still have a seat at the United Nations? What happens to their fishing rights? and their mineral rights? What is the citizenship of their displaced people? Do they have 
legal rights against the countries that cause them to be underwater. Uh, none of those are obvious questions, and so we can meet at a conference, as you mentioned, last May, uh, and attracted about 260 people registered from 40 countries uh, to, come to, the, to come to the conference because there are a number of countries around the world that are uh, facing this issue. Uh, so why don't I start with the issue of sovereign? Uh, okay. still a state. Uh, in international law, there are basically four basic attributes of sovereignty. Uh, the first is a defined territory. The second is a permanent population. The third is a functional government. And the fourth is the ability to have relations with other countries, basically, or do other countries are recognizing. So if a country is underwater, the first two of these uh, are automatically in peril. One of the questions is how many people do you need to be a permanent population? And there's some general sense that it needs that about 50, something like that maybe about the number. It's not enough just to have a lighthouse with a lighthouse keeper. You want to be able to have people, you want to have families, you want to be able to have people form families and have babies and so forth. That's sort of the, the uh, attributes of a regular country. Um, there have been in history uh, a few states without territories. Uh, for a time, the Holy See had no territory until the formation of Vatican City. There's something called the Knights of Malta, which is a group that sort of spun off from the country of Malta. There are a couple of examples. Uh, no country has ever ceased to exist because of a, a physical uh, disappearance. Uh, obviously, countries have ceased to exist because of military action and, and political things, but, but this, this has never, uh, quite this has never happened before. There are also some governments in exile. You know, you can look at Tibet, in a sense, as being a government in exile. There are other countries that have sort of an uncertain nature, they have a permanent territory and a permanent population, but their statehood is in, um, there, there are ambiguities about it. Taiwan is one example of that, which doesn't have a seat at the, at the United Nations. So there are, there are the, these strange statuses, and, and one thing that is now under active discussion, at least among uh, legal scholars who look at this, is the idea of the ex situ state, the state that exists outside the territory. Uh, again, the question has never come up, but if the time should come when everybody evacuates one of these island nations, then the issue of an ex situ state may arise, and one could imagine the question being put to the United Nations, well, uh, can this state uh, survive? But does, are we still going to uh, recognize it? So does that imply then there are no real legal precedents for what would be, I mean, as you say, you know, aside from military conquest, you know, no country has, has literally disappeared. So where are the precedents that you might draw from if you were to take this into a court of law? Like, where, where would they come from? In the first place, I think that, that it would be probably the United Nations General Assembly would be the initial body that would look at it eventually. It might go to the International mm -hmm. Court of Justice. One would look to the underlying principles of international uh, law, but as I say, there are these four basic principles that have been established, and, and it would be it would be unprecedented to have to raise that question. The hope is that the rest of the world would feel so guilty about having caused the greenhouse gas emissions that caused these nations to drown that they would um, that would make the this exception. You know, that one aspect of these countries is their own greenhouse gas. Um, uh, emissions are completely minuscule, and so they, they bear no responsibility at all for what's happening so, uh, in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the other consequences of statehood, one of the other attributes of statehood, is there's an exclusive economic zone uh, of uh, you know a couple hundred miles around the land, and during in that area, among other things, the country controls its fishing rights. So one of the most significant sources of income to the Republic of the Marshall Islands is the fishing 
mostly for tuna that takes place within its exclusive economic zone. So the other countries who, that have commercial fleets have to pay the Marshall Islands for the right to fish in their waters. If the country ceased to exist and if it no longer had an exclusive economic zone, um, then some of those countries could be able to fish there for free, which would be very attractive. So one of the other issues that has been discussed is that under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, there are procedures for permanently fixing maritime boundaries and, and exclusive economic zones. But exactly how that works, if the country itself seems to be gone, nobody has ever had to deal with them. So that would be uh, one, uh, one question. If I may, uh, check going on what you were just, just chatting about, uh, I'm very curious, uh, looking at somewhere like Antarctica, and you have all these countries that are vying for, uh, they're vying for their own territory to carve out their peace. How do you begin to define that boundary? Uh, so the, the question for the people who don't hear the microphone was about Antarctica. And Antarctica, by as a matter of international law, is really, a, uh, it, it, it is not part of any state. Uh, there, some states have certain rights to use it, but it's not, it, it, it's, for one thing, it's not populated. It has no permanent population, so it lacks that essential attribute of statehood. Uh, but there are international treaties that govern who has access to Antarctica and, and can use it for various purposes. But it's, it's, it's like the open seas in the sense that it's not, it's not part of the territory of any nation, and under current international law, it cannot. And then we have the Arctic, which of course doesn't have land. And so uh, it, it, not, it both lacks a permanent population and it lacks actual land. And before too long, it may lack actual ice. <laughs> and, and just to, to further that, you know, step, as far as defining uh, territory, uh, if you could talk about that for a moment. And, uh, in these areas uh, in the world where you have constant fluctuation uh, in the ice and these kind of boundaries that do exist, such as the edge of the ice cap on Greenland and things like that, how would you begin to define territory to something that's constantly changing? Is, that, is, there, any, is there any kind of conversation that you Well, in terms of the question of how to define territory, the territory doesn't exclusively have to be dry land. And so there are countries that have territory that's offshore. And um, there are you know, sort of declarations of boundaries and, and uh, that have been going on for centuries in terms of how to define it. So the territory of Greenland is not going to be impaired by the melting of its ice. It, it, it has fixed boundaries. Um, now, Greenland, and, and Greenland is not an island, and it's, it's not in danger. I, I mean, it is an island, but it's not, it's not in danger of submersion. Um, so that issue won't arise. Greenland could arise for the Marshall Islands and Maldives and Palau, Micronesia, Tuvalu, some of the small island nations. Um, I'm curious actually about the, re the reverse of the scenario that we're talking about for the Marshall Islands and Kiribati and, and, and Palau, et cetera, um, where you actually have a, a scenario similar to in Greenland, for instance, where the ice melts and reveals that what was a peninsula or what, what they thought was a peninsula turns out to be an island. Um, or the Okinatori Islands south of Japan, which are you know disputed whether or not they're a reef or they're an island, et cetera, and what that means for the territory of Japan. Um, and then there's even um, there's just a, a slightly ridiculous uh, example, which was a, a near surface island in the Mediterranean called well, it's called a, a variety of things. The British want to call it Grand Bank. Um, the Italians, I believe, call it a Fernandia. Um, but the idea is that it's, it's, a, it's an active volcano that occasionally breaches the surface of the water about every 200 years, and then it washes away. Um, but there are people who are basically ready to claim this as part of Italy. Um, and when this happened in 1831, I believe, was the last uh, eruption when it broke the surface of the water. It was around for two months, three months, six months maybe, but um, the British Navy claimed it, Spain claimed it, Italy claimed it, etc. cetera. Uh, I guess I'm curious about um, those kinds of examples where uh, territory either appears or changes in some otherwise uh, unexpected or unanticipated way, which might have an effect on a national border and therefore might have an effect on an on a, um, EEZ. And if that is something that would have a precedent for, for the, it just in reverse, it'd be kind of an anti-precedent. Yeah, certainly that kind of dispute does arise from time to time, and there are procedures under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea for fixing maritime boundaries. There are some tribunals that have been established for that purpose because that sort of maritime boundary dispute is not rare and we now have 
uh, procedures for resolving that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a relatively kind of dry legal situation as far as borders go? Well, there are often you know, knock down, drag out legal fights, but, uh, mm -hmm. but they, it, they can be resolved under established rules. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not unlike you know, a thousand other kinds of legal disputes that may be difficult, but ultimately they can get resolved. Yeah. Um, well, as far as a, a, a territorial or spatial uh, <coughs> solutions or requirements for the ex situ state, I guess I'm just curious about what are the leading theories for what that might, uh, the format might take. I mean, are they going to be reservation style um, land purchases that are going to, you know, accept refugees from these, these countries, or is there some entirely different uh, model for the post territorial nation? And what, and what is it? If so? Well, one of the big issues is if people leave, do they all leave at once and go to the same place? Mm -hmm. uh, because part of the sort of the, part of the assumption as, as people envision this is yes, you have a, an exodus, and they all go to a particular location. That is not what has happened. There are now uh, people leaving these islands, uh, leaving these countries, uh, mostly not because of climate issues, but because of economic and other situations. It's not well known, but there are now about 10,000 people from the Marshall Islands who live in Springdale, Arkansas. And, but, and let me just spend one minute on how that came to be. Um, in uh, 1986, when the United Nations, when the United States essentially gave the Marshall Islands its sovereignty, its independence, they entered into a, what's called a compact of free association like a treaty. And under this agreement, one of the provisions of it is that people from the Marshall Islands can freely enter the U.S. without a visa and can work here. They don't become citizens, but they can work here lawfully. Um, and so uh, the, the economy of the Marshall Islands was not in such great shape. Um, and uh, a few people from the Marshall Islands got, a job, got jobs at a Tyson's food processing facility in Springdale, Arkansas. And it turns out that they're very good workers, and the Tyson's Food needed a lot of people to work there processing their chickens. And the Marshallese, unlike the Mexicans, are legal. And so they've been hiring large numbers of Marshallese. Um, and uh, so the, the most recent census numbers uh, came out from the Marshall Islands, and actually the population of the people who live there has been fairly flat, largely because of so much migration, and a lot of it to the U.S., and a large portion of that to Springdale, Arkansas. The, the government of uh, Marshall Islands has established a consulate in Springdale uh, to take care of the people who, who live there. Uh, but uh, so you have this, this sort of unplanned movement of a lot of people to Springdale, but there's no talk of setting up a special reservation in Arkansas for the Marshallese where they would have their own, um, uh, their own government. You know, there are examples in the U.S. of <coughs> insular communities that form and, um, and take over um, a municipal government. That's happened near New York State with some of the Hasidic communities. Uh, but it's not a reservation, it's just that they have the, popul they have the majority of the population and they can elect the town government. Uh, so, you know, there, there's some, some thought of having reservations. You know, the, the U.S. obviously did this with the Native Americans. It didn't always go so well. Uh, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a bright, shining, wonderful model we could look to of, of success. Uh, no country has, set, has stepped forward and said, we will, we will give up our sovereignty over some portion of our property so these other people can come. You know, some governments have said, okay, you can buy our land. Uh, but the question of how they're governed, and whether they have any different legal relation to anybody else, is an open question. Big question, do they become citizens of where they go? Mm -hmm. I mean, in Springdale, the, the parents of the people who move there are, as I say, don't have a path to citizenship, and they tend to speak only Marshallese. Nobody else speaks Marshallese, so there's not a lot of interchange with the community at that level, but their children who are born here automatically become Americans upon birth. They go to the U.S. schools, they learn English, and in a generation or two, pretty much the old culture is gone. Same typical immigrant pattern has happened in 
mig migrations, uh, but the, the old culture is gone. So one of the major questions is, is there a, an ability to preserve the cultural identity of the, of the population? I have to say, at the conference we had last May, one of the most striking moments was we had a formal dinner uh, in, in the Rotunda Flow Library, the, the, the major ceremonial space at the university. And the 40 or so people from the Marshall Islands who had come mounted the stage and began singing the, uh, the Marshallese songs led by the president on the ukulele. <laughs> And just sort of, you know, projecting the message, this really is a culture that we have and that we would like to find some way to preserve. But I'm not sure that Springdale, Arkansas is the ideal, is going to be the place to really preserve that culture. Um, well, I have tons of questions, but I'd love to open it up to anyone else in the audience that might. Benjamin? Yeah, thank you so much for the um, fascinating. We would have one. Should we mic? Yeah, it's actually, I think it might be might thrown already. Or, uh, or it's 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 okay. Okay. No, okay, I'll try it. I'll try it. Um, Speak up. Yeah, I'm. I'm interested in 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 maybe moving it back to where Jeff's in with the the larger question of uh, how it is that we think about the governance of an ecology and the relationship between sovereignty and jurisdiction within that. And it seems that the the Marshall Islands case and the one where we have a, a sovereign territorial jurisdiction that may be literally subtracted from the from, from the map because of the machinations of, 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 of the ecology is is one it is a fascinating entry point to the larger question of what are what should be or what could be the appropriate jurisdiction with which we might govern and, and govern a planetary scale ecology. And the way in which we've attempted to do this to date is through the mechanisms of a, a federation of nation states that all have different kind of interests, all are sitting on different kinds of energies, all are either industrialized or unindustrialized. And I wonder whether or not the state is really the right scale of representative to some sort of means by which we think about the governance of a, a governance of ecology. So first, I wonder if you have if, thoughts on this. But and then second question has to do with extending Jeff's question about what might be possible for the ex situ territorial state, uh, and what are, what how might we think about that? And um, you know, the, while you were talking about the Marshall Islands, I was also just thinking of another. Um, for some reason, my mind sort of parallel vision of that is of Nauru, also in the South Pacific, right? So Nauru was an island that has, over the its fraught history, had been every European power had come and planted their flag there at some point, and because of the the rights that the sovereign jurisdiction of the colonial power claimed on it, they did all sorts of things to Nauru and the phosphate and the rest of it. So the the legal fiction of the state allowed Nauru to be, you know. Um, have the history that it did. And then when it became independent, in a way, Nara sort of inverted that fiction and used all sorts of things to, for offshore banking and, and um, uh, issuing passports to whoever paid for them and things like this. So they used the game of the state and the things that the condition of the state allowed them to do to sort of, to perhaps sort of invert this kind of, this, these sorts of structures. So the question, I guess, in a way is, is are there, in, in addition to simply how do we preserve the state and the cities. Are there other ways in which, in your experience, people are thinking about the possibilities of an ex situ territory, of ex, ex situ, uh, ex post territorial uh, sovereignty um, in such a way that we might allow the Marshallese to do things that the Marshallese wouldn't have been able to do, or the access to spaces and things that they've to do, so that that license of citizenship actually has some capacity to do things in some way? So I have another question, but those will be the first two on this side. Right. So yeah, please. So there are there are some things that states can do that only states can do. So and you you referred to a couple of issue passports. Um, they can uh, they can have their own currency. Yeah. Uh, they can have fishing rights. They can have ship registries. Uh, you know things of that sort. Uh, and, and people can be uh, can be citizens. 
I think the, the, the sense to date is that it would be awfully difficult, awfully risky, and problematic to confer any of those powers on a non-state. You know, the Supreme Court has gone very far to declare corporations persons. Right. Do we want do we want to go further and declare them explicitly states and allow some corporation to be issuing its own currency or its own passports or something like that? And if so, who decides who's eligible for that kind of treatment and how are they governed? Uh, you know, at least we have the tradition that with a state you have you can you can have you have a fixed territory and population and that's who's supposed to make the decisions, the population. But if, if is it the board of directors of the corporation? There are all kinds of really difficult governance issues that arise if you begin <laughs> to give them state-like authority. Mm -hmm. And so I've heard very little discussion in legal circles about extending statehood uh, to these kinds of novel mm -hmm. uh, entities. Uh, you know, I know that in some law legal circles it's been discussed, and I'm interested in sure, how yeah. that would work. Yeah, I guess my, uh, my question was more to do with Less to do with what, uh, how the rights of the state might be extended to things that are unambiguously non, you know, non-state, not political uh, agglomeration. That it had to do with if, what kind, what might the sovereign rights of a post-territorial Marshallese citizenship entail, um, given when when that when that territory go, territory goes away, and I mean, and I mean in terms of this, I mean sort of specifically. One of the interesting jurisdictional. Um, Outcomes around the IP, particularly the IPC, IPC in Copenhagen, was the development of was the, the the alliance of small small island states and the power that the alliance of small island states as a kind of subfederate actor to to work in concert in a particular sort of way way as well in a way so that they in a way had a con that this this um, plurality of, of utterly discontinuous populations with completely different cultures. Nevertheless, had the capacity to to turn this in, in a way which so it, so that their I don't know if you want to call them a jurisdiction, but their sovereign power is sort of invented from the question of how do we govern ecologies, and so this question of governments of ecologies produced something or perhaps with this alliance something like a uh, a new nascent form of sovereignty as well. So I, 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 I'm asking I'm, ask, I'm asking you to speculate, and maybe you're, it's. Um, uh, so with, with yeah, I mean the uh, AOSIS, the Association of Small Island States, is a coalition. Essentially, it doesn't have any of the attributes of sovereignty. There, there are lots of coalitions that have, you know, OPEC. Mm -hmm. You know, we can think of, of lots of different groups of nations that have had different kinds of powers. But there, so mm -hmm. there's nothing novel about that. You know, they formed together in lots of other, uh, lots of other uh, formations. Mm -hmm. um, but. If there were an ex situ state, um, it would, you know, the hope is that it would have a lot of the attributes of a state that has its own territory in terms of being able to have citizens and passports and so forth. Mm. There actually is something of an example of that in the Marshall Islands, uh, in that uh, between 1946 and 1958, the United States conducted its outdoor nuclear weapons testing program in the Marshall Islands. And dropped a total, I think it was 67 nuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands on the atolls of Bikini and Anahuitac. Um, Bikini to this day is uninhabitable because of the remaining radiation that is there. However, in the capital atoll of Majuro, um, right next to the hotel where I stayed when I visited, is the Bikini Town Hall. And so the Bikini Town Hall stands there as a building. The, the people of Bikini retain their identity as a political entity. They still elect a senator to the parliament of the nation. Um, but the town, and, and the, the town hall exists largely so that the people can go collect welfare checks and other social services. Uh, but, but they have retained their political identity and have a seat of government, even though they can't go home. Uh, that, in a, in a sense, is, uh, is emblematic of what might happen here, that, that maybe some of these countries might have a seat of government in Arkansas or wherever it is, and people would go there and they would, uh, they would cast absentee ballots to elect their president, 
of the parliament. We have some of those powers. Question how stable that is. For how long can that keep up? You know, there are, there are some civilizations that have existed in the diaspora for a long time, but not many, and it's not easy. And there have been a lot of hardships along. Um, this is two, uh, two more questions from the audience. Thank you, that's a key one. I'm curious about actually Tibet as a, a model there, and what you think the the um, the overlaps or lessons are there in a place where there is still the territory, but it is occupied or not. Or yeah, I mean, I don't think that the exile territory of Tibet is the exile, the government exile, as you call it, is recognized by a lot of other countries, you know, with an ambassador and so forth. Obviously, the home territory is run by another country that doesn't like them very much and that has displaced them. So I don't know how uh, congenial a model that is. Uh, you know, it's certainly a way to preserve some cultural identity it has that effect and, and the hope of a return someday. One of the distinctive things about the island nations is there would be no hope of return. If they're underwater, they're underwater forever. Um, and uh, so you can't, uh, you can't go home. So that, that's a qualitative difference. So are you working with, with the martial islands on trying to sort of alter the definition of statehood? Is that where the, where the sort of lobbying is going to go to set it for? criteria for being a state, if we want to change that, because we're not going to have that tension. Thankfully, um, that issue is still decades off. Um, it's not that submersion is around the corner. One thing that's very important to point out, and I only learned this, I really came to understand this while I was there, was that a place becomes uninhabitable well before it's submerged. The time comes when it is underwater so often, when it has no remaining freshwater drinking water supplies because of salinization. Um, it's so disruptive that people can't uh, can't live there anymore. Already in Majuro, the capital island, in the Marshall Islands, the principal source of drinking water is the airport runway. They collect rainwater runoff from the runway, and that's what they drink because the, ground, the groundwater supplies, uh, most of them have been contaminated by salt water. Uh, and uh, they already have frequent flooding, it's becoming more frequent, so people don't move all at once. But they're more urgent need, they're more, they want to stay there as long as possible. Uh, the Marshall Islands have been, have been inhabited for several thousand years by many, many successive generations. They really want to stay there. So their focus now is adaptation. Their focus is what can they do to have uh, water and land and other thing, electricity, other things they really need to live, and trying to require the major developed states that are responsible for this plight of rising seas to, to pay them for the cost of continuing to stay there. Uh, so that is their current priority. Uh, leaving is their last resort. Um, I, I don't know if this is a, it, maybe if, even possible to, to answer in, in, in short terms, but I guess maybe just combining that briefly, the, the last question with Benjamin's question. Um, yeah, I guess it, it just seems really interesting to me that there might be, you know, there was a time where there, where there weren't states or nation states as such. You, you had what, principalities, cantons, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering if um, the legal invention of something that would be uh, a, an entirely different type of state with an entirely different kind of citizen. I mean, this just goes back to a lot of things that we've been discussing already. Um, might be something that maybe, uh, you know, the Marshall Islands might actually, in, in many ways, could, could spin the loss of territory in, into a kind of um, fortunate event of, of having a totally different type of nation state that recognizes citizenship in a totally different way, uh, that has no necessary territory. And it would almost be like, um, you know, a ship that can be registered in Panama one day and, and, and in the Congo the next, you know, where you're, it, but it's, it's an, a human, you know, who has a kind of, um, uh, yeah, stateless, uh, diasporic, shifting uh, uh, allegiance to a, a, a kind of 
diaphanous state that doesn't quite exist in, in, in territorial form. I don't know, I guess I'm just curious, where would that legal invention take place? Would it be something in the UN? Would it be some legal scholar at a, at a university in the Midwest just coming up with something and trying to pass a, pass a law somewhere? Um, but how does one legally generate a, diff, a new type of state and where would that be recognized? Uh, so that's not the priority of the Marshall Islands. I think that they would regard that as too abstract and, and remote to, okay. to address their, their actual uh, issues today. The ideas probably would come from academics or who knows, you know, from, you know, who cooks up these ideas. But I would think that, you know, right now the United Nations is the, is the international body for making those kinds of decisions, but uh, it's a function of its member states, so there would have to be buy-in from a lot of member states. And I would think that a lot of the member states would find that a very disruptive idea, uh, mm -hmm. that if people could spin off an entirely different uh, <coughs> different uh, schemes and stop paying taxes and maybe have their own armies, do all kinds of things that many states would find very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I think that it would be a, uh, it, would, it would be a, a, an uphill Line. Let me just put it that way in order to, uh, to achieve it. Some compelling case would need to be made to justify moving in that direction away from the model of statehood we've had for several centuries. Well, well, once you become a citizen of the UN, you know, and the UN would be the body that would potentially kind of be the umbrella across the, the sort of floating population in some ways. Well, wasn't there somebody, uh, maybe this is an urban legend, but did someone uh, claim Yuthan Island briefly? Or some, uh, like a, drunken New Yorker went out to Youthon Island behind the United Nations and claimed it as a micronation for, I don't know, 24 hours, or perhaps it's an urban legend, but in any case. I think there was between having a claim and proving it. Yeah, <laughs> and having an army. Um, well, so yeah, just because of time, uh, we're going to have to leave it there. But, uh, but thank you very much, Michael Gerard, for, for the interview. And, and um, uh, yeah, everyone, you can, definitely, you can see uh, Michael's links to his work on, on the website at Columbia, as well as a lot of articles about uh, his, his work in the conference last May. So definitely check those out. And um, uh, so thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. So yeah, what we're going to break down and maybe uh, in about 20 minutes we'll kick off the next uh, panel discussion. So feel free to get, yeah, get a drink, uh, make yourself comfortable, and we'll uh, be back up here in about 20 minutes. So thanks.